Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's session. My name is Vicki Lightbound. I'm the Director for the Water Innovation Program at Alberta Innovates. This is the third webinar in the 2022 Water Innovation Webinar Series. I'd like to take a moment today to respect, respectfully acknowledge that we are coming to you virtually from Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territories in Métis Regions 3 and 4 in Alberta. I will highlight that the reach of this work and its activities influence and are influenced by all treaty territory and all Métis regions in Alberta, not just those from which we come to you today. This acknowledgement respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all Indigenous peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. For those of you not familiar, Alberta Innovates is a provincial corporation created to support research and innovation activities. We provide funding programs, advice, connections, technical expertise, and applied research services. Our scope encompasses the whole innovation journey from applied R&D through to commercialization and end use. This includes science informing policy and practices. The Water Innovation webinars share ideas and outcomes from projects funded through Alberta Innovate's Water Innovation Program and highlight other important water initiatives within the province. I hope this session will provide you with some valuable information and spark discussion. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can after we hear from all of our speakers. The session chat is a useful tool to connect with other participants. I'd encourage you to use the tool to discuss the session topic, but please don't let it distract you from the presentations. With that, I'd like to welcome everyone to Alberta Innovate's Water Innovation Webinar. Today's topic is what is in our water, microplastics, tire fragments, and more. Our day-to-day -day activities impact water resources in ways we are still learning about. As we develop and use new products to meet our needs, we also release new compounds back into the environment. Pharmaceuticals, microplastics, tire fragments, and much more are entering our rivers and lakes after being washed into stormwater sewers or flushed down the drain. It is critical that we understand the occurrence and impact of these contaminants to determine what management steps may be required. Our speakers will share some of these latest data, sampling methodologies, and management frameworks related to a few of these contaminants of concern. Today, you will hear from Steve Wiseman, Associate Professor at the University of Lethbridge, Paola Musone, a Vintiv Applied Research Chair in Energy from Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, and Kelly McKittrick, Cape Chair in Ecosystem Health Assessment at the University of Calgary. So now let's get started. Um, I'll pass it over to Steve. You can start sharing your screen. Um, Steve will pre be presenting his research on tire fragments in stormwater. And hopefully Steve has disappeared from my screen. So hopefully you can start sharing here. All right, we may have lost Steve. Paolo, we might jump to you if you're ready. <laughs> um, get Paolo to load up your, your uh, slides and we can sort out Steve here next. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Let me... Vicky, can you confirm that uh, my slide deck is up? I'm just waiting here. Yep, your slide's up. Um, off to you, Paolo. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. I'm really happy and excited to be here with you today. I'm going to be sharing uh, some of our recent work in the area of microplastic science. Uh, the title there refers to um, some of our activities that we've been conducting in, conducting in the Edmonton region, uh, focusing on the North Saskatchewan River. And uh, before we jump into that, however, I'd like to take it uh, from really the 37,000 foot level and start by introducing some terminology. Some of you may be lesser familiar with the microplastic space. Uh, and so I, um, I'd like to start with really introducing this. There's uh, generically speaking, at least three large categories of particles that we call microplastics. Um, sorry, do we call plastics contaminant in the environment? There's uh, the ones that are larger than five millimeters, this is an arbitrary measure that most people use. There's no such thing as standards really about that yet, uh, that are called microplastics. And then there's uh, fragments that are in the five micro millimeter to about 109 nanometer in range, again, fairly arbitrary, 
That's what we actually call microplastics. And then there's fragments that are even smaller than that, and that's what's generically called nanoplastics. Uh, they, th these types of contaminants come from all kinds of sources. They are generically categorized in two types, primary and secondary. Uh, primary microplastics are those types of materials that have been intentionally manufactured to be in that size class that I just uh, showed you. Uh, and these are things like beads and powders and other engineered materials. They are materials that are used in um, all kinds of applications, some of them now uh, not uh, allowed anymore. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. And then there's the secondary microplastics. These are particles that originated from large fragments of, pl of plastics and that over time, uh, due to uh, physical uh, processes or chemical processes or biological processes, end up being fragmented, broken down into much smaller fragments. And um, uh, this is really the biggest part of the problem uh, when we look at microplastics contamination because it's coming from plastic materials that have been abandoned or improperly discarded in the environment. And on the right hand side, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you uh, four pictures uh, taken from Wikipedia as an example, right, where you can see some of these fragments. The bar notes a size of one millimeter, so you can see some of them are quite a lot smaller than that. Where are we at in terms of science? What's known about these plastics? It's a relatively new science. And by that, I mean that uh, the output in terms of published papers or peer reviewed documents uh, has been very rapidly increasing in the last five years. Um, but really the field hasn't taken off, uh, it didn't really take off since about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, originally, most of the work came out of ocean type studies. Uh, and this is because of the much known and publicized ocean uh, uh, big plastic patch that's uh, that's in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if you look on the left hand side, this is a table that I, uh, a pie graph that I found quite interesting when doing some literature survey, recent literature survey for our project, and uh, discovered that in fact most of what we know about microplastics is coming from work that's been carried out uh, studying model systems. That's the other. Uh, section of the pie chart uh, and from sediments. Uh, there's also an unknown uh, component in this pie chart that um, the person that collected this, this type of information wasn't really able to, uh, to explain in terms of source, lots of uh, literature that was published, but without a clear uh, focus. This is really literature early in the days. And importantly for our conversation today, the segment of knowledge that we have currently in the published literature that refers to water is only 15%. And a very large fragment of that, no pun intended, has to do with, as I mentioned, uh, ocean uh, research. The freshwater system, freshwater systems have, just, have been studied a lot less. Uh, as I mentioned, it's, an, it's a rapidly growing area of research internationally, and uh, thousands of publications are now published every year. Uh, unfortunately, on our side of the world, in Western Canada and Alberta in particular, there's very little knowledge in the area of microplastics. I'm aware of only one paper uh, that has been published in, uh, in if, you, if we look at Alberta as, uh, as a region. Um, more importantly, I think, for the future, uh, we have not yet seen data collected uh, still being, we haven't seen yet data that are being collected and generated being saved in repositories that are accessible by the general public or by government agencies. This data tends to still live with the researchers. A lot of this data still tends to live with researchers. And, and I think going forward, it's going to be important to find ways to harmonize and access this type of data. Where do they come from? Where do microplastics come from? Uh, microplastics are known from this uh, literature that, I, that, that is published to come from all kinds of sources. There's evidence that they may come from wastewater treatment plants, particularly the ones that don't have tertiary um, uh, filtration systems installed. They can come from all kinds of industrial processes that have not been equipped with uh, uh, methods to retain them uh, or to retain other contaminants. Uh, and so this can include a wi very wide range of, uh, of outputs into a system like a river, for example. There are studies that indicate they may also come from landfills. And uh, this could be a historical legacy of the way we're, that we've been disposing of, of these materials in the past. Uh, increasingly, there's evidence that they could be found in biosolids. And so this is important to note uh, with an eye towards thinking about 
impacting on the agricultural sector, for example. And there's uh, significant evidence that some of these microplastics come from urban runoff. Uh, last but not least, of course, microplastics form one of the foundations of modern society, technological materials. We all wear clothes at some point that, that are made of polyester and other materials uh, that are plastic based and uh, all of those products uh, are known to shed, to release um, these types of uh, emerging contaminants into the system. What do we know in terms of uh, the science as far as uh, where microplastics uh, are going uh, is also related to uh, some emerging evidence that shows that their concentration, their occurrence is very, very directly correlated with how we use the land. Uh, and particularly with uh, the way we use, the, the way that urban environments are structured. So the way that, uh, that cities are structured, for example, around a, a large river like, uh, like in the Edmonton region. Uh, they're, they're highly correlated with population density and also uh, with the type of wastewater treatment facility that may be affecting that water body of water. Very importantly, the physical characteristics of the watershed are very important. And uh, related to that, uh, the seasonal influences uh, are also an important factor in affecting microplastics concentration. And this is primarily through a phenomenon, a phenomenon uh, that we know as the runoff. So in a, in a, a geography like the one that Edmonton is in, where the uh, North Saskatchewan changes dramatically in how it flows through the, through the year, uh, this is one of the very important variables that, uh, that should be studied when, uh, when contemplating doing microplastics research across a region like ours. Why are there a concern? Um, microplastics are a concern because the yearly volumes that are released in the environment uh, are known to be significant. There isn't an actual uh, measured output yet of, of how they're released, but they've been estimated globally in the millions of tons. And uh, there's reports that have been um, trying to come up with estimates based on uh, how much of these plastics are currently being landfilled. And uh, we're looking at very significant volumes. So with an eye to the future and the, and, uh, the growth of the use of these types of materials, uh, understanding the impacts of these contaminants and where they are is going to be very important. Occurrence and fate in freshwater systems is a very active and important area of research. Uh, we don't know much about where they accumulate in what portions of a river system, for example. And we don't know much about what end, ends up happening to them. We know that uh, depending on their size, for example, they can be ingested by crustaceans or they can be even uh, populated by bacteria and algae and, uh, and where they ultimately end up in the environment is, is really an active area of research right now. The chemical structure uh, of plastics can lend itself uh, to accumulating metals and, uh, and organic contaminants that are in the environment. So in this sense, microplastics become an emerging contaminant because uh, they can function as a vector for uh, in an accumulating place for, for other contaminants that are already in the environment. A lot of plastics are created and formulated by using different components. So they're not pure compounds in themselves. And uh, there's growing evidence that uh, when abandoned in the environment under certain conditions, uh, one can witness the leaching of some of the components that are in the, in the product that have been abandoned. And so uh, we may have components that are plast plasticizers, as an example, that leach out as microplastics and in themselves, uh, uh, this can create a problem. And as I mentioned, uh, the effect on microbiota is largely uh, unknown. Uh, we know that uh, microplastics can form a, a great substrate for the formation of biofilms. And, uh, and there's evidence in the literature that uh, microplastics um, can be populated by different kinds of microbiota, depending on which point on a river system, for example, flowing through an urban settlement, uh, that there can be there. Where are we at in terms of regulation then? The regulatory situation is, uh, I would like to call it very fluid. Uh, I am not aware of any uh, regulations yet, really, that uh, govern microplastics pollution. Uh, there are two pieces of legislation, however, that are currently uh, prohibiting the use of microbeads. So this is a, uh, a particular type of product that used to be in some consumer products. Uh, in both of those types of, um, uh, that, that type of, additive to some 
toiletry and other consumer products, um, uh, available materials is now banned both in the US and, uh, and also in Canada. Uh, the European Chemical uh, Agency has been working for now, uh, for now a few years on uh, creating a framework uh, around microplastics pollution, and uh, there's an there's an uh, there's an expectation that by the end of 2023, uh, this agency will report back to the European Union, and um, and a framework uh, will be in place about potentially monitoring microplastics in in specific type of uh, industrial situations. But uh, the jury is still out on that front. From my perspective, probably the most interesting situation from a regulatory perspective is the one that relates to a bill uh, passed in 2018 in the Senate of California, Bill 1422. That bill required the state uh, water resources control board, also known as the water board in, uh, in California, uh, to accomplish a couple of things. One was to define microplastics, at least for that part of the world, uh, specifically in drinking water. And this was accomplished on July 1st of 2020. And uh, further, the, the bill required uh, the Water Board to come up with um, four particular strategies uh, that I'm going to talk about in a second by July 1st of 2021. Uh, the first item was to uh, adopt the standard methodology that was going to be used for testing drinking microplastics in drinking water. Uh, and this has been accomplished with a policy handbook that was published in August of this year. Uh, the second was to adopt the requirement, uh, requirements for four years of testing and reporting of microplastics in drinking water uh, in California. And this is work that has not yet started. Uh, it's slated to, to commence in 2023. There's a consultation effort that's happening right now in California on where to start and, and how to do it. Uh, the third item was uh, starting to lay the foundation for issuing in notification le levels and other guidance uh, to help consumers with interpretation of these testing and results. And this work is also ongoing. And very importantly, uh, last but certainly not least, um, the, the State Board has also created a process for uh, creating, uh, basically for qualifying laboratories that will be working um, with the state uh, to support the creation of this data bank. So this is all ongoing in Southern California. And, um, and, and I'm happy to note that uh, our research team, Jeremiah Brooks, uh, particularly on my team, is, is one of the members on the uh, working committee that's, uh, that's developing these, uh, uh, these lines. So with that background uh, in mind, uh, I'd love to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, our specific involvement in the, in the microplastic space and um, the project that we currently have ongoing. This is work that's funded through Plastics Research in Action, Heartland Copolymers, Heartland Pol Polymers, excuse me, and Dow Canada collaborators on the project. Uh, the project is really aiming at contributing to the standardization efforts that are ongoing as far as both sampling and also processing of, uh, of samples, fresh water, as well as sediments. Uh, the standardization is very important because uh, the ultimate goal is, uh, is the idea of creating uh, an ability to compare samples across different jurisdictions. And um, uh, until late 2020, it was really a bit of a far west situation with, with no real guidelines. At least now there's an ASTM standard in place, ASTM 8332, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that's been really instrumental in guiding some of this work. On a science level, the project is, is really designed to contribute to understand better how microplastics abundance, uh, their chemical composition and physical shape is linked to a variety of factors. Uh, one of them is the multi-seasonal variation that we see in our river. And in order to monitor that, we carry out bi-weekly sample, sampling events, both from the shore and, and from boats. We're also trying to correlate all this data with freshwater chemistry parameters, things like temperature, pH, the ions that are present in the water, total suspended solids. And very importantly, in terms of uh, study design, uh, these sampling events are happening around uh, well-known natural, uh, urban, and industrial inputs into, into the North Saskatchewan. Uh, I'll talk about specifically the, um, the segments of the River Valley that we'll talk about in just one second. So, um, 
just unable to move forward. There we go. Um, we're carrying out the sampling events uh, across about 150 kilometers of River Valley in, this, uh, in the Edmonton Municipal Region. Uh, I've created here a table and maybe a little hard to read of the, the sites that we're investigating. Uh, each of these sites represents either the boundary of the region that we're studying or uh, well-known inputs into the North Saskatchewan that we consider significant. See if I can move to the next slide. The relevance of this project is, uh, is multiple fold from our perspective in, in this context of understanding microplastics as emerging contaminants. Uh, one of them is that it's the longest multi-year freshwater microplastic study in, uh, in Canada. Uh, I think it's the largest one in uh, west of the Great Lakes, at least the one that I know of. And um, to date, we've already generated the largest collection of freshwater samples for this type of study. Uh, it's also the first one to directly assess the impact of one, uh, one industrial facility that manufactures plastics. This is the Heartland Co Polymer Complex, um, which has a direct discharging outfall into the river. And the reason why I say directly assess the impact is because we've been collecting samples around the facility before the facility commenced operations, as well as uh, during its commissioning and now as the facility is in full swing. And uh, importantly, I think from a, um, from a social licensing perspective, it's the first project to really look at microplastics impacts uh, carried out in partnership with a plastic producer in Canada, at least the first one that I know of. I mentioned to you earlier that the North Saskatchewan is a challenging environment for, for doing this type of work. Uh, there's at least two reasons for that. One is that, um, especially at runoff, the river uh, has a really high flow rate exceeding 300 uh, cubic meters per second. And um, for anybody that has taken a, lot, a walk along the river valley, you can see it's very heavily loaded uh, with suspended solids. Uh, this creates a, a difficult combination when it comes to being able to effectively sample microplastics. Uh, the use of mesh nets and trawls and other tools that are typical of ocean studies becomes very difficult. Nets tear up uh, or they become clogged. And so it's uh, it's really hard to, to do any meaningful sampling at, uh, at that time of the year. I'm talking about the May through to sometimes middle of July periods. And so one uh, possibility that was put forward by ASDM, I mentioned ASDM D8332, uh, was really the idea of uh, pumping water out of the system rather than uh, extending a fishnet into the river and pump uh, water out of it across a cascading set of sieves uh, to collect uh, representative samples. Uh, there has been a large debate about what is a significant amount of water that needs to be extracted to have a representative sample size. And uh, ASDM in the first iteration of this work recommended 1,500 liters as, uh, as the target. So this is what we're going with for the time being. In terms of demand on the pumping system, uh, for this method to be uh, uh, really deployable with ease, uh, we, we faced the need to develop something that was lightweight, want to be able to transport it easily into the field, so port portable, uh, but also modular. The idea that um, you can put the components into a backpack or into a series of backpacks. In order to be able to work an entire day in the field, then uh, the system also needs to be powered by a reliable power source. And this creates some interesting constraints in terms of, the, in terms of design, which I will talk about in a second. And very importantly, this was not actually specified by, by ASTM in detail. The system has to be plastic free. It, uh, it turned out to be extraordinarily difficult uh, to find, especially a pump system that wouldn't contain any plastic at all. Because plastics are, are such a foundational component of uh, what we do in the 21st century. I'm showing you the schematic, schematic diagram, and then I'll show you a picture of what the system looks like. Um, in essence, the system is composed of a collection of segments of uh, uh, tubing. Uh, these are all fitted together uh, using uh, very easy swage lock type uh, components. And so they're all slotted uh, together and then connected with a pump. Uh, that uh, uh, moves the water out of the river system uh, and onto the cascading set of sieves. Uh, the system is powered uh, 
externally, so we, we don't need to have, um, we don't need to rely on the grid. And the flow rate is, uh, is monitored at the outlet of the pump. And the water flows through this cascading set of seeds that I will show the picture of in a second. So this is the, the system that uh, we deploy in the field. We affectionately, affectionately call it River Beauty. Uh, you can see the inlet of the river on the top left of the corner and uh, the sample outlet right in the middle of the picture. The centrifugal pump is held high above the, the water level and the sieve stack is positioned uh, typically four to six weeks out from the bank. And this is in order to prevent erosion. Uh, from the from the water that flows downward. I mentioned that um, uh, powering the system is a critical piece of this uh, of this apparatus, uh, and it's crucial to be able to work in the field for an entire day. Uh, we were able to find this. We were able to find a lithium iron phosphate uh, 12 volt battery uh, that, in fact, is able to last through the day. And, um, and this is easily housed in a, in a waterproof case that allows us to, to deploy and operate in the, in the field even when, when the weather is less than ideal. Uh, the system is also composed, as I men mentioned, of a centrifugal pump. And uh, the entire system fits into these two portable items. The pump itself is really the heart of the system. And uh, this is a deviation from uh, the, 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 our choice, the, the idea of using a um, centrifugal pump was a deviation from the recommendation that ASTM put forward, which was to use a submersible pump. Uh, as it turns out, we were not able to find submersible pumps that we could power with the power source that we selected. And um, uh, the centrifugal pump that we use uh, was the only one that we could use where uh, comp plastic components were, were simply not present and that that was light enough that we were able to uh, carry it in the field and power it with a 12 volt, 12 volt power supply. So we um, we went back to ASTM in June of this year. There's a slide about this later on, uh, explaining the work that we had done and made recommendations to include this as a, as a variant on the method. The sieve stacks are uh, easily purchased uh, commercially. Uh, they're composed of uh, four different uh, sieves. There's a five millimeter sieve that sits at the top, a 500 micron, and then 125, and finally a 45 micron at the bottom. And um, we also use, when we're in the field, we typically use a dual slot uh, position right next to the main sieve stack, which is basically our environmental uh, blank sieve. You will have noticed in some of the pictures that we arrange uh, the sieve stack uh, slightly tilting in one direction. Uh, this is so that we promote um, airflow and circulation. And this, this really, in, in the beginning of the season, we found it's very useful in promoting, in, uh, excuse me, re re reducing the risk of clogging as we go through the sampling event. I mentioned earlier that we set up the system farther from the shore, and this is, to, this is like I mentioned, to avoid erosion of the system. Uh, especially at the beginning of the season, it proved very beneficial to have spare 45 sieves, sieves uh, at hand. Um, and this is because when the river is really loaded with total suspended solids, um, the, the sieve itself can become clogged quite quickly. So if I was to summarize this, um, the system is capable of collecting 1,500 liters, which is what ASDM expects in, in the current version of the standard in approximately 45 minutes. Uh, when you're running this system in duplicate, which is what we're doing right now, uh, it means being able to generate at least 10, sometimes 12, on long days, even more than that, samples for each of the locations that we're operating in. The system is very easy to set up. A skilled uh, crew, like the one that uh, now operates in the field for Nate, is able to do that in less than eight minutes. And um, it's also a system that allows you uh, to track what the contamination might be uh, using those blanks. This is also an addition to the ASDM standard, which doesn't contemplate that. I'm proud to say we've run the system in, um, like I was saying earlier, lesser than uh, clement in inclement weather. Uh, and um, the whole apparatus proved to be weather resistant. So um, there's no, no real need to pack things up and, and leave site if, uh, if a shower comes along. 
uh, the, the work has been ongoing for uh, this particular project has been ongoing for three years. The system that I showed you has been in use for uh, now two field seasons in the updated and the modernized version for, uh, for the season of 2022. So the last recent one we've been sampling across we've been sampling in all kinds of situations cross river upstream downstream we've been able to collect samples uh, using a boat so that's a kind of midstream effluent uh, situation and mid river uh, an image of uh, of how we go about doing some of the sampling is provided here just for for a bit more context for those of us that um, benefit more from seeing visually how the systems are set up and uh, the flexibility of, uh, of the setup also allows you to measure directly from an effluent if, if that's one of the objectives, uh, as well as uh, assemble on, uh, on a boat like the ones that we're picturing here. This is work carried out in collaboration with our industry partners at uh, Interpipeline. All these um, findings and learnings, as we call them, uh, about building the system, operating the system, iterating on the design of the system, and some preliminary data about uh, this using the system. Um, we collected and presented recently at uh, an ASDM symposium. This was held late in uh, June of this year. Uh, a symposium that was set up as an opportunity to gather input from the community of practice on the uh, ASDM standard D8332. Uh, and, uh, and at that event, we showcased our sampling system, like I mentioned, and, uh, and provided feedback uh, to the community that's, that's in this field. Where are we going next uh, with this work? In terms of sampling, I, I believe it's going to be very important to uh, reduce costs of deployment and um, uh, having a crew in the field of experts uh, is, can, can be very expensive having four or five individuals in the field at all times uh, is expensive. And, um, and we heard this from, from industry partners that would be interested in, in getting into monitoring for, on their own, uh, but don't necessarily have a full crew uh, available to do that. And so the idea of moving towards autonomous sampling is one that was brought to our attention about a year ago or so. And so we initiated a project that's, uh, it's about, that was really about developing an autonomous system. So we went through a cycle of engineering design and then uh, commissioning, and then we were able to deploy uh, the system that you see here uh, in the field in late 2022. In terms of validation, uh, we've been able to bring the system out for one uh, sampling event in late summer. And um, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a part of our work to bring the system out further into the field next summer and, and further validate it. In terms of future work, uh, what's on the horizon for us uh, is finding a way of uh, prime the system. It's a centrifugal pump, so it needs to be primed. Finding a way of self-priming the system so that technicians don't have to do that. That, that can be time consuming and, uh, and a bit laborious. Uh, we're looking at options to be able to do that. Um, importantly, to expand the science and knowledge about what's in the environment, adding 20 micron sieves. Uh, this is not obvious. In some situations, it might require a vacuum system or some, some contraption that we haven't quite figured out yet. Uh, importantly, in terms of knowledge dissemination to the community of practice and to scientists, uh, we are developing uh, digital content and uh, knowledge content. Uh, we're working on creating webinars, tutorials, hands-on training materials that we would love to disseminate, not just with our own students, but as I mentioned, with students in general, industry professionals, government, and, uh, and other researchers that are interested in this field. Uh, the project is currently scheduled to continue until March of 2025, so we have two more field seasons ahead of us uh, where we'll be collecting samples. A key piece, I believe, not just for this project, but for microplastic science and, uh, and for the community of practice, for regulatory agencies, with an eye to the future, I think, is training the next generation. We've invested very heavily on that already uh, in getting up to speed with uh, techniques, both in the field and in the lab. And uh, we've included students that come from uh, the Edmonton region, all the, all the institutions that, uh, uh, that have been active in some way or another in the microplastic space. So lots of students from Nate 
uh, but also students from U of A and, uh, and McEwen. And on the safety side, being in the field, for those of you that enjoy it, like myself, um, needs to be done with care, obviously, and I'm happy to, I'm happy to share with that over 750 hours uh, to date and, uh, and no, no accidents. I'm the one presenting today, but really the magic is in the team that has, uh, has been doing the work and has done a lot of heavy, heavy lifting also in generating the, the literature surveys and, uh, and gathering the input. Uh, the project really wouldn't be where, as far as it is without Jeremiah Brookser in right in the center and with the rest of the team that's, that's participated in, uh, in making this happen and pushing it forward. So a big thank you to the Technology Access Center for Sensors and Systems Integration here at Nate. I mentioned to you Heartland Polymers and Dow are supporting this work. Uh, we're also thankful to NSERC and to MyTex for funding a, a good portion of this work as well and our students too. Thank you for listening and uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Paolo. Really appreciate the presentation. Highlights the importance of understanding how we're sampling and not, and not just looking at the data on the back end. Um, I'll get you to stop sharing your screen and we'll move over to Steve. Looks like Steve has been able to join back in. A reminder to everybody to please submit your questions that you may have for the speakers in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end of the session. And, and really apologies to those that are having trouble uh, connecting and listening in. We appreciate your, your patience and your persistence this is a new platform for us, so there's a, been a few unfortunate technical challenges. All right, Steve, um, over to you. All right, hopefully you can see that and you can hear me. Uh, we, oh, it's coming back now. Yeah, you're good and we can hear you. Thanks, Steve. All right, perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me uh, today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a particular chemical called 6-PPD quinone, which in a, in a toxicological, uh, in toxicology, we've only known about this for probably less than a year. But in, in that year, there's been a lot of concern about this chemical. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of why we're concerned about it some of the work that we're doing here at the University of Lethbridge and with colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan, and then some of the work that we're probably envisioning down the road. <clears throat> this, it's, it's a large student component to this work, um, undergraduates and graduate students, both here at the University of Lethbridge and the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, we're funded by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and their Contaminants Advisory Group. Um, also, so funding through Alberta Environment and Parks at the Office of the Chief Scientist, NSERC and, and my lab, I'm funded by a Canada Research Chair. Uh, and this picture you see over here on your right, you can see this is some stormwater flowing into the, uh, the Old Man River here in Lethbridge. And there's a, there's a certain irony uh, in that picture. It'll become a little more clear as I go through. So just some background. Um, for quite some time now, we've known about this phenomenon known as urban runoff mortality syndrome. And this was primarily uh, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, particularly in around Seattle and Tacoma area. And what they had seen is that during the coho salmon runs, uh, during the spawning season, um, you would often find, you know, coho salmon would die in, the, in these small streams that they were uh, uh, migrating in. Uh, those that weren't dead were displaying mouth gasping uh, or gaping, fin splaying, disorientation, a loss of equilibrium. Um, and, and this gathered a lot of attention. And as researchers looked into this, it seemed to occur every time there was a, a rainfall event or a storm event. It only really impacted coho salmon. Uh, other species like chum salmon weren't affected. And so, you know, coho being a species of, of considerable importance uh, there was a lot of effort went into trying to figure out what was causing these fish to die and there's been numerous papers on urban runoff mortality syndrome you know at first it was you know the usual suspects is it pesticides you know insecticides or herbicides uh, well that wasn't the answer uh, whereas was it heavy metals was it basic water quality you know um, 
it might seem counterintuitive, but sometimes when you get really heavy rainfalls and a lot of storm water entering a river, you can actually get hypoxic events, so a lack of oxygen. Uh, none of those uh, were the answer. And what it turned out was that when you looked at the water chemistry, whenever you saw these mortalities, you also saw tire wear particle leachate in the water. So you're seeing, you know, you just saw the presentation on microplastics, you're seeing microparticles of rubber tires. So this was the first clue that had something to do with rubber tires. And then last year, this, this paper came out in Science, uh, and it's, it's an excellent paper. And what they did is they identified this particular chemical, 6-PPD quinone, as the cause of this urban runoff mortality syndrome of coho salmon. What they basically did is, did is they took some fresh tires and some old tires. Um, they ground it up and took all these particles, um, leached chemicals from the tire, and then through a series of steps, they would fractionate that, th those chemicals into different uh, groups. And eventually they got down to a fraction that had a small enough number of chemicals that they could do toxicity testing. And what they found is that there was one chemical that caused toxicity, but they had no idea what it was. And then through some, you know, some literature searches, uh, through some mass spectrometry and other methods, they were able to determine that it's this 6-PPD quinone that's causing the mortality. Uh, in the picture here, you can see in, the, in uh, this little orange speck in the test tube, that's 6-PPD quinone. Uh, it, it, it's, it's orange colored and we'll see that again here in a little bit so the culprit is 6-ppd quinone but 6-ppd quinone isn't put into uh, tires what's added to tires is 6-ppd and in the environment 6-ppd gets converted into 6-ppd quinone and this is actually uh, by design so we want our rubber tires to last we don't want them to degrade quick, uh, quickly um, so antioxidants are added to tires and there's a whole suite of antioxidants that are added and what they do is they they diffuse to the to the surface of the tire and they scavenge uh, ozone and other reactive species or oxidant species and this forms a protective film on, on the tire and that prevents ozone from um, breaking down the elastomers in the rubber so this picture up here of a tire pile, if you see on some of these old tires, it's actually orange. And that's the same color as the chemical back here uh, after they had isolated it. So this orange in your tires is 6-PPD quinone, the same chemical that was killing uh, the coho salmon. Okay, so this is all by design. 6-PPD is added to tires. It reacts with ozone to prevent breaking down of tires. So this is all by design. This is what's supposed to happen. So after this, this landmark study came out showing that 6-PPD quinone was the cause of you know, coho salmon mortalities, uh, Department of Fisheries Oceans here in Canada put out a call for funding and uh, myself along with colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan, particularly uh, Marcus Hecker, Dave Jans, Lynn Weber, and uh, Marcus Brinkman. Uh, those are the PIs at the University of Saskatchewan. We got some funding to look at uh, native species of fish or um, other species of you know commercial or economic or, or cultural importance and at the time when we got the funding we just by chance happened to have a couple species of fish in our aquatic facilities so here i had brook trout available to me at the university of saskatchewan they had rainbow trout arctic char and they had some white sturgeon from a project they were doing previously completely unrelated to this and so what we did is we did some very simple sour assays where we exposed each species to 6-PPD quinone. Um, the brook trout work was done at the University of Lethbridge where I am, and then the other species at the University of Saskatchewan. What we found is that both brook trout and brook trout are quite sensitive to this chemical, particularly brook trout. Um, all of the fish in our study were dead within 24 hours. Uh, of exposing them to 6-PPD quinone. In fact, in our highest um, exposure concentration of four micrograms per liter of this chemical, um, everything was dead within, I think it was three hours. Uh, after the grad students had started the study, 
uh, one of them came up to get me and asked me to come to the aquatic facility to take a look. And I, I figured, you know, something was going wrong. Maybe the water, the plumbing was broken. Who knows? Uh, and when I walked in the room, well, all the trout in these tanks of the high concentration of chemical were dead. And those that weren't dead in the other groups were displaying some pretty erratic behaviors. Rainbow trout, they're a little less sensitive. Uh, they don't start dying until about 12 hours in the highest concentrations, and they can live up to 60 hours depending on the concentration. But both species are sensitive to this chemical. Interestingly, Arctic char weren't sensitive at all, and neither were white sturgeon. So since that, there's been a, quite a few uh, studies reporting the sensitivity of various species of fish. And here, what I show on this graph or this, this slide is really just the salmonids. So if you look at the salmonids, we have Arctic char, which we've published, they're insensitive. Bull trout are insensitive, which is great considering their uh, conservation status, particularly here in Alberta. Brown trout are insensitive. The West Lobe cutthroat trout is insensitive. So the bull trout and the, and the cutthroat trout was done in my lab. Um, Atlantic salmon are insensitive in a paper that came out recently, although um, I suspect that might change with some other data that's coming out from some colleagues uh, in New Brunswick. And a recent study uh, from Japan showed that a particular species of dolly varden and another species of salmon are insensitive. So at concentrations, depending on the study, from five to 20 micrograms per Sorry, all looks like um, we lost Steve's audio. It seems like he's having some connectivity issues. Um, we'll give him a minute here and see if he can join back in. Uh, again, apologize with the system. We will um, have a recording available for those later. All right. Okay, we've lost his sharing now as well. Maybe he's back here. Steve, are you back? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. We've lost your share screen, though, if you don't mind sharing okay. that again. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Can you... So can you see my screen and hear me now? I can hear you, and your screen's coming up. Thanks, Steve. All right. So I'm not sure how far I got into this. Uh, I'll, I'll, basically what we have is we have a situation now where not every species of fish is sensitive to this chemical. And, you know, on, there's a lot of species that have been tested to date, a lot of species of cell models that are tolerant, but a few that are sensitive. And what's interesting is that there doesn't appear to be any strong phylogenetic relationship. Um, brook trout are very closely related to uh, Arctic char. Arctic char are completely insensitive. Brook trout are the second most sensitive species we have. Uh, rainbow trout are sensitive. Other species very closely related to the rainbow trout are not. So it's, it's pretty interesting uh, that we have these great species sensitivity differences. And that's one of the things we're curious in, trying to figure out what the basis of that is. And we think we're making some headway. So I hope this video is working, but you can see here this is a rainbow trout exposed to two micrograms per liter of our 6 PPD quinone. And this is a pretty typical behavior. Um, you know, they, they turn upside down. Uh, just prior to this, they were gasping at the surface of the air. So they, they look quite healthy. And then within a matter of a few minutes, they go from gasping for air, being disoriented, going to the bottom of the tank, then turning over. Uh, there's some, you know, some, some gill movement there. Um, you know, some fish show much greater uh, phenotype than others. But looking at this, we, we, we suspect that it has something to do with uh, respiration or respiratory uh, physiology. So I, I want to go into a little bit of the mechanistic work we've done trying to figure out why this chemical is causing these effects. We did, we, we simply looked at um, mitochondrial function. So mitochondria 
uh, utilize oxygen to produce you know, energy in the form of ATP. And so using gill cells and liver cells from rainbow trout, what we see is that for rainbow trout exposed to 6-PPD quinone, they have a greatly increased rate of oxygen consumption in the gills. But that's not the case in the livers. Uh, interestingly, the livers are able to biotransform or metabolize the chemical, whereas the gills don't. So we think what's happening is that the gills lack the ability to break down the 6-PPD quinone, and as a result, the, the chemical is affecting oxygen consumption. So it's utilizing its oxygen uh, quite rapidly. So it's not a complete story, but we, there is some indication that the site of toxicity at least is the gill, and it has something to do with oxygen consumption rates. So we think it with biotransformation or metabolism. So if you look in sensitive species that we've used, we don't have access to coho salmon. But in brook trout, they don't metabolize the chemical at all. Rainbow trout do metabolize it, but not great. So there's, there's two types of metabolism we look at. Uh, we break it down into phase one and phase two. Uh, the small check mark here by rainbow trout simply means that there's a little bit of metabolism of the chemical, but not that much. In the West Slope cutthroat trout uh, and in the white sturgeon, both of which are tolerant species, they're quite good at metabolizing this chemical. So part of the reason why species differ in sensitivity appears to be the ability to at least metabolize the chemical. Uh, the way we are able to find metabolites is by looking in the bile. So over here in, the, in these little um, centrifuge tubes that we have, this is bile from uh, West Slope cutthroat trout, which are quite tolerant of the chemical. And if you look here, we have two tubes that are quite dark red. Uh, one a little bit, you know, reddish, orangey. That is actually the 6-PPD quinone, the chemical building up in their bile. And we don't see that in the control fish. So the bile of the treated fish um, looks like the chemical is accumulating there. And that might be something we can pursue to, to develop a biomarker of exposure to this chemical where we could go out and sample fish in the wild and look in their bile for whether they've been exposed or not. So we think metabolism plays a role and we think uh, the gill respiration plays a role. Uh, the other thing that plays a role is hemoglobin. So hemoglobin transports oxygen. So if you look in Arctic char, um, whether they're exposed, which is the red bar, or whether they're a control fish, which is the green bar, in Arctic char, we have no differences in what's called methemoglobin. In rainbow trout, the level of this type of hemoglobin is much higher. And what's significant about this type of hemoglobin is that one, sorry, one of the iron molecules in hemoglobin um, is actually changed in its state. So normally iron is in a, what we call a ferrous state, but in some hemoglobin you get conversion to a ferric state. And when that happens, there's a decreased ability to bind oxygen. So if you can't bind oxygen to hemoglobin, then that oxygen can't be delivered to um, to tissues and organs. So if you're a gill, what little bit of oxygen you have, you use it up very rapidly in a sense of the species and you don't get more delivered to the gill. So that's more indication that oxygen metabolism is probably playing a, a role in the sensitivity of, of fishes um, to the 6-PPD quinone. So that's the work we've done on uh, mechanisms of toxicity and some differences in species sensitivity. We, we definitely have a lot more uh, to do on that end. So what I want to turn to now is a little bit more about environmental levels of 6-PPD quinone. So the scenario is pretty simple. You drive your car, there's wear and tear, um, particles build up on the roads, you get a rain event that debris that builds up on roads flushes into surface waters and organisms get exposed. If they're a sensitive species and they're exposed to enough, you could get lethality. Now, two to 45% of the total tire, tire particle loads enter receiving waters. Um, and sediments can contain up to about 5,800 milligrams per kilogram of tire wear particles. So tire wear particles are entering uh, our surface waters. If you think about you know, the situation here in Alberta, 
uh, particularly here in Lethbridge where I am, we go incredibly long periods without any rainfall. So, you know, we go two months without any significant rainfall. That's two months of, of rubber tires breaking down and particles building up on highways. Then we get an intense rain event, all that material flushes into our surface waters. And so there's, you know, uh, there's a real diversity of chemicals entering, uh, including the 6-PPD quinone. So this is some data from that paper that first reported this chemical. And so I want to walk through the graph a little bit here. Um, what we have here is we have data from two different sites in Seattle where they collected roadway runoff, a site in Los Angeles, and then we have the receiving water in Seattle and receiving water in San Francisco. The red line is the LC50 or the concentration of this chemical that causes 50% mortality to coho salmon. The dashed line uh, are the amount of this chemical that will leach out of either 1,000 milligrams per liter of tire wear particles or 250 milligrams per liter of tire wear particles. And then the data are these points uh, and, and these box plots. Basically, what we have here is, you know, at one site in Seattle, we have concentrations up to 19 micrograms per liter uh, of 6-PPD quinone. Other areas, it's in that 4 to 6 range. In Los Angeles, it's around 5. Then in receiving waters, not surprisingly, it's quite a bit lower because you get dilution. Um, but the point here is most of these data points, particularly in roadway runoff, are well above the concentration that is lethal to coho salmon and also the concentrations that are lethal to brook trout and rainbow trout from the work we've done here in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So levels in the environment are at or in excess of concentrations that are known to cause acute lethality to some species of salmonids. And so that is concerning, but that's in the Pacific Northwest where this urban runoff mortality syndrome was first noted. So the question is, well, what about, you know, in Canada and more specifically here? So th there really hasn't been much done. There, there was a study done in, in uh, Ontario in the, in, the, in the Toronto area looking for 6-PPD quinone and some other compounds that are found in tires. Tires are full of different chemicals, um, not just 6-PPD quinone. And there was a study done in Saskatchewan as well. And so I want to highlight the study done in Saskatchewan a little bit because Saskatoon would be, you know, it's somewhat like Edmonton, Calgary uh, in its climate. And just like Edmonton, Calgary, and Lethbridge is a river that runs through the middle of Saskatoon. So colleagues there um, performed a study where they collected stormwater and looked for 6-PPD quinone. And, and the graph here shows the dates that they did sampling, and there's some notes on the side of both. So on June 19th, there was no precipitation. They collected stormwater, and there was no 6-PPD quinone. Not surprising. On June 20th, they sampled about nine hours into a storm event. After, you know, by that time, seven of the 25 millimeters of precipitation had fallen. And six PPD quinone concentrations were quite high, as you can see from the, from the bar graph here on the 20th of June. On the 25th of June, um, they sampled into a storm event, but it was 24 hours before they, they, they conducted their sampling. So while there was some six PPD quinone uh, in the storm water was as on June 20th when they in. And that's important. Equinone comes off of roadways quite rapidly uh, after uh, or during storm events. So you really have about nine to 10 hours, maybe 12 hours to capture the chemical. After that, if you sample, you really don't find it. It washes off quite quickly, which is important uh, and can inform us about future storm water sampling. When you do a regression analysis, what you find is that the major drivers of 6-PPD quinone in stormwater are roads, residential areas, and then commercial areas. Industrial areas really don't have much of an effect and not surprisingly green area. So basically, wherever you have cars driving on roads and you have a lot of that, that's, you know, that, that's going to contribute to the 6-PPD quinone in stormwater. So if you take, and there's been a couple other studies since this, but if you take a couple of different studies, the study along the U.S. West Coast, 
the study in Toronto, the study in Saskatoon, and you look at the concentrations in stormwater, there are concentrations in there that are in the range and in excess of the concentrations that cause uh, toxicity to salmonids. Um, so this is, I'm sorry, this is mixed up here, but the brook trout actually has an LC50 of 0.59 micrograms per liter. So 0.59 micrograms per liter will kill brook trout in less than 24 hours. And that's a concentration we regularly find in storm water uh, in these areas. Now in receiving waters, it's a little different in the West Coast. They do find it up to 3.2 micrograms per liter, which is again, in excess of the concentration that causes lethality to all the sensitive species we've identified to date. In neither Toronto or Saskatoon did they detect um, in receiving water, but I know the authors of both studies and their uh, there, uh, including not sample the receiving waters and when. So what about Alberta? Um, we don't know anything yet, but, but shortly after we published this work, with our brook trout and rainbow trout, we, we were talking to Alberta Environment and Parks and the Office of the Chief Scientist, and they were, they were kind enough to give us some funding to start looking at stormwater in Edmonton, Calgary, and, and Lethbridge. So in Edmonton, we've been working with EPCOR, and they've been doing some stormwater sampling for us. In Calgary, the city of Calgary has been doing stormwater sampling. And here in Lethbridge, uh, it's not been the city, but it's been an under, a former undergraduate student of mine, Emily Mertens, who's been going out uh, and riding her bike in the rainstorms to sample stormwater for me. And I've just got two pictures of stormwater here in Lethbridge that Emily samples. Uh, for folks that might know Lethbridge, this top stormwater, this is near uh, the Lethbridge Golf and Country Club. It probably drains, it probably has the largest catchment area of any stormwater um, stream in the city. Um, concerningly to me, it is about, I don't know, 200 meters upstream of our drinking water intake. Um, and then our other site here, we have four sites in Lethbridge, but another site here, this small uh, flow of stormwater, this is water that's running directly off of uh, this bridge. Uh, this is Whoop Up Drive. And the irony here is that we do have a rubber tire sitting directly in this stormwater that we're using to look for uh, stormwater related chemicals. So we have all the samples collected. We've been collecting samples for about six months now in each of these cities, four to six sites per city. And the samples are currently running on a mass spec at the University of Saskatchewan. So I don't have data to show you. Um, but what I will say is I guarantee the chemical is there. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that our analysis is going to show 6 PPD quinone in stormwater in each of our cities. So I say that because I've seen what other people have published. And I say that based upon this table that was in this paper that came out. These are estimated global annual environmental releases of 6 PPD quinone through tire wear particle leaching. So this makes a bunch of assumptions. Um, you know, Composition of 6-PPD, which is a parent compound, can be anywhere from 0.4% up to 2% of the mass of a tire. Um, your average vehicle has four tires. You know, a heavy vehicle has you know, an 18-wheeler, obviously has 18. And if you do some calculations based upon the, the amount of 6-PPD in a tire, the amount that um, six of 6-PPD is converted to 6-PPD quinone, and then release into the environment, what you can see is that, let's say, you know, with 25% reaction yield, so 25% of 6-PPD is converted to 6-PPD quinone, the low end scenario is that we get 6.3 million, you know, kilograms released per year, up to 31.6 million kilograms on the high end. So people drive cars, tires break down, 6-PPD quinone is in your tires, and it rains. So 6-PPD quinone is going into stormwater. I, that, that much I can guarantee you. Um, so we'll see what the data says for Alberta. So where do we go from here? Um, what we've done is looking in, in the stormwater. The next thing we want is to go into the rivers and see what we're going to find in rivers. We want to continue looking at species of fish. We've only done a small number. 
uh, we'd like to look at more and see whether species might be sensitive, you know, pike, walleye, um, you know, the different species we want to look at. We want to look at life stages. So we have some data from the University of Saskatchewan showing, showing that the early life stages of rainbow trout are actually much more sensitive than the sub-adults. The data we have right now is for sub-adult. The new value, the new lethal dose that causes 50%, that value for early life stages is much lower than it is for adults. So they're much more sensitive, at least in the rainbow trout. We want to start looking at mechanisms of toxicity or not start, but keep doing that. Trying to determine some biomarkers or are there things we can measure in fish to know if they've been exposed or not. And finally, um, what is the role of stormwater ponds? You know, stormwater ponds are, are quite popular. You find them in new neighborhoods uh, being built. Uh, they're quite used here in uh, in Lethbridge. And, you know, the typical scenario is that water enters a stormwater pond, pollutants settle to the bottom of the pond, and then clean water or cleaner water returns to lakes and rivers. Well, what about 6-PPD quinone? You know, are these rubber tire particles accumulating in stormwater ponds? And if they are accumulating, are they staying there? Are they being flushed out with rain events? Or are they continuously releasing 6-PPD quinone into stormwater ponds? And then that's entering our environment. So we get this continuous release. Uh, we don't know. But those are the sort of things we want to, to do next. Uh, but that's it for me. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you for working through those technical challenges. Um, I'll get you to stop sharing and we'll pass it over to Kelly if you're able to share your screen. Um, we'll make sure we can see your slides and we can hear you. Am I stopped? Yeah, you're, you are... you're good, Steve. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Kelly, and just waiting for your slides to come out. Uh, do you see my slide? Uh, I'll give it a minute here. Yep, they're coming up. Thank you very much. You're good to go. Okay, okay thanks. And and thanks for uh, in, inviting us to uh, give an overview of our Bow River uh, project. It's a bit of a different flavor than the last two projects. Um, what I'm going to do is is give you an overview of a, a very large project that Fred Rona and I have started in the Bow River. Um, we started in response to a, a call for proposals from the city of Calgary that wanted to see uh, some work done at our aqua facilities. <clears throat> the aqua facilities are uh, advancing Canadian water assets, uh, which are a, a, a series of experimental treatment systems and artificial streams uh, that are integrated into the Pine Creek wastewater treatment plant in, in Calgary. And so um, we made a proposal to start looking, um, using those facilities as well as the river to try and understand uh, uh, a number of things. One is to do a better, better uh, examination of the impacts of Calgary's municipal effluents. Calgary has three major um, wastewater treatment plants. The Bonnybrook plant is about 65% of the effluent flow in Fish Creek is about 15% and Pine Creek at the south end of the city is about 20% of the, the treated wastewater for the city of Calgary. And uh, Calgary's treatment plants also treat a number of surrounding municipalities and towns in terms of, of their, their waste load as well. We also want to try and differentiate the relative importance of municipal effluents and stormwaters and identify priority areas of concern in the Bow River and ultimately integrate the kinds of uh, indicators that we're looking at into regional monitoring. There's also an interest both provincially and federally in the potential to develop environmental effects monitoring uh, programs for wastewater facilities. On the left here, you see the Pine Creek wastewater uh, treatment facility on the right, uh, one of three experimental stormwater treatment systems that the city of Calgary is uh, is working with. So we've got funding also from Alberta Innovates and a variety of other partners I'll talk about in a, in a second, but uh, the technology objectives are really looking at trying to develop effective indicators um, for 
receiving environment uh, responses from primary productivity up to fish to help develop thresholds that can be used to to guide the optimization of, of water and wastewater treatment by the city, to identify key indicators and, and monitoring triggers that will be used to identify areas of concern, and then to engage with the city stakeholders and local indigenous communities to develop knowledge translation, communication tools, and approaches to, to evaluating um, ecosystem changes. It is a, a large team that we have. Um, Fred and I are based at the University of Calgary. We also have researchers at the University of Alberta, um, at uh, McMaster, University of Waterloo, and at uh, University of Florida in, uh, in uh, 11 uh, HQPs uh, at uh, the University of Calgary, as well as HQP at, at the other facilities. So I mentioned the partnerships with the City of Calgary and, and Aqua, um, also with Al Alberta Innovates, NSERC, the Bow River Basin Board, Indigenous Communities, the River Watch Institute of Alberta, the Bow River Trout Foundation, Alberta Environment and Parks, which is now the EPA, uh, Environment and Protected Areas, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. There's really four themes to what we're, we're trying to do. The first theme is emerging substances of concern, looking at the fate and transport in the river. Uh, theme two is basal productivity and biological responses. Theme three is really looking at some of these molecular tools, transcriptomics and microbiomics. And theme four is uh, indigenous engagement. Now our indigenous uh, theme was delayed quite a bit by the, the pandemic in, in that uh, there was limited um, ability to to interact but we have now started that that theme for with some uh, kickoff meetings that we had quite quite recently so in, i'm just going to go through the different themes so if it's green we're well on our way to it if it's yellow we're we're we've started it and if it's black it's it's really for um next year that we'll be focusing on that so the first theme is maricor or arlos from alberta in Edmonton and the Mark Servos at the University of Waterloo, which is really looking at the fate and transport of these emergent substances of concern, developing fate and transport models, um, in, incorporating those uh, studies with uh, the biological endpoints that we're looking at, and then coming up with some modeling approaches. And what you see on the right there is, is one of these aqua streams that are 340 meters long and there are a series of 10 pools and 10 riffle areas um, where we do a lot of the studies. Um, the suite of emerging substances concern, the city of Calgary has been doing a, a lot of work over the last several years. They've got a, a large suite of ESOX that they look at, uh, nine hormones and uh, three contraceptives, a variety of industrial surfactants, plasticizers, flame retardants, uh, as well, we include in that group insect repellents and, and some others. A suite of pharmaceuticals that include four analgesics as well as antibiotics, antidepressants, antiepileptics, cardiovascular drugs, and some other pharmaceuticals, and then some artificial sweeteners and stimulants as, as tracers. And so Maricor has had a variety of, of students that have been doing a a lot of analysis of the data as well as collecting um, a lot of new data on both the uh, streams at Aqua and again that's one of the Aqua streams there as well as uh, studies in the river. The second theme is what uh, Fred and I are, are working on and uh, that's a picture of one of Fred's students getting the uh, benthic samples. So looking at examining changes in paraphyton, macroinvertebrates, fish and microbial communities in both the aqua streams and in the river to improve our understanding of, of nutrient contaminant interactions on, on the, the lower levels of the food web, the, the algae and the bacterial components, um, quantifying the benthic food response and understanding responses with traditional types of environmental effects monitoring endpoints for benthic macroinvertebrates, biofilms, primary producers and, and fish. 
on the left here is is uh, this is some some work from uh, Brianna's uh, master's project. On the left are some cotton strips in the aqua streams um, that have been put in and left for several months, looking at uh, degradation pathways. On the right are some nutrient diffusing substrates, which again are trying to look at some of these interactions between nutrients and, and contaminants. Um, just an example of, of one of the uh, the work the students uh, are, are doing. This is just a picture of substrates. Uh, Afra, uh, Sutherland has sites that go from upstream of Canmore sewage treatment plant downstream of there. And this is just pictures of substrate as you come into the city of Calgary and then the three um, wastewater treatment plants at Bonnie Brook uh, nose uh, at uh, sorry the nose creek is a stormwater uh, creek that's coming in um, drains by the airport then downstream of Bonnie Brook and downstream of, of Pine Creek and you can see the amount of, of substrate Afra's uh, uh, project is uh, looking at uh, the community metrics in uh, benthic invertebrate samples as well as comparing different approaches for um, looking at the benthic invertebrates and from upstream at Canmore, the number of, of invertebrates per square meter go from the hundreds and downstream of the city of Calgary to the tens of thousands. And uh, AFRA is well on her way towards uh, um, uh, completing her thesis, uh, hopefully shortly, and uh, lots of, of really useful information coming out of what she's doing. Uh, Rajiv Tana is a, a PhD student who's looking at fish. We've done the fish in the river and in cages. This is just wild fish and traditional kinds of environmental effects monitoring endpoints. What we would expect to see at a sewage treatment plant as because of the food that's going in is that fish would be fatter, would have bigger livers and would be reproducing more. So this condition on the left is uh, you see fish at the reference site downstream of Bonnie Brook, Fish Creek and Pine Creek. And you can see that the condition factor, which is just a body mass index for the fish is about 25% larger uh, downstream of the sewage outfall. Liver sizes are more than double as you get downstream of the, the sewage, but we don't see a corresponding increase in gonad size. So this is in female long those days, suggesting that there, there are some reproductive challenges for the fish. Um, Neil's got a, a tremendous number of samples that are we're starting to work our way through processing. Transcriptomics and microbiomics, um, caged exposures of fish and aqua streams. Patricia Marjan has finished three sets of, of caging exposures in the stream to look at, to try and characterize the transcriptome changes um, and to compare uh, gene expression microbiome responses in Bow River and Aqua to try and, and look at different pathways. Uh, Karen Kidd from McMaster's actually trying to follow some of the uh, microbiome responses that are coming out of the sewage treatment plants as they go through the food web in the aquatic system and into the terrestrial one along the streams. And in, in we got some exciting time last summer out collecting spiders at night. Um, I never thought I'd be a spider collector, but I am. So Patricia's done caging experiments at Aqua with uh, long nose days, trout perch and spoonhead sculpin. And uh, Rajiv has done um, caging experiments in the river downstream of the three uh, sewage treatment plants, as well as in three uh, stormwater treatment areas. And uh, lots of data, as I said, are, are, we're just starting to, to work our way through. Indigenous engagement, inclusion of community members, including leadership, administration, elders, and youth will help support the development of conceptual models for practical integration of traditional and scientific knowledge. And there will, will be con inclusion of community-based researchers and graduate students to try and bridge the gap between traditional and technical knowledge and in developing toolkits for successful engagement. 
as well as highlighting the role of land-based reconnection activities in enhancing community participation and decision making. So future work, some of which we got started this year, we've got a new PhD student who started at Nose Creek. Uh, Nose Creek, as I mentioned, comes in. If you drive along the highway, it's uh, as you come past the airport, there's a creek on your right hand side and it has uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 180 plus stormwater outfalls that come into the creek. And so we started some uh, collections in Nose Creek, um, expanding and building our indigenous collaborations, some targeted assessment of, of fish macroinvertebrate biofilm responses to increased um, wastewater exposure. The streams typically run at 5% effluent uh, we just completed uh, last week, we upped the concentration in the stream to 15% effluent and, and did uh, some uh, caged fish exposures as well as, as uh, macroinvertebrate and biofilm. Um, the modeling work is starting up and, and we're continually looking for broader stakeholder in, involvement in the work that we do. So, trying to create opportunities for proactive identification of environmental degradation and, and treatment technology development. Picture on the right is a, a picture of the aqua streams when they were first built. There's of course a lot more vegetation there now. Um, trying to leverage the full potential of, of this facility. It's a globally unique stream mesocosm infrastructure. We have a very large grant application into the Canadian Foundation for Innovation to continue to expand uh, the potential uses of that facility, but it, to allow for more robust risk assessment of, of complex organic pollutants and trying to develop assessment tools relevant for policymakers and, and end users. Our learnings really from the, the first part of it, a lot of advantages working closely with the city. They've got a tremendous amount of experience and, and uh, monitoring that goes on in the city of Calgary and trying to add biological components into that system. And that our interdisciplinary group broadens our, the training for our grad students. In terms of the ESOCs, our tissue extraction methods need to be improved. We don't really have the, uh, the capability to get down to the level of detection that we need when we're working with these, these small organisms. Um, in terms of the basal productivity, we've done some comparisons of different technologies and the glass slides that some groups use are less viable for biofilm biomass and chlorophyll A measures compared to some methods we're using with ceramic briquettes and, and river rocks. And then in terms of the biological responses, as I mentioned, the invertebrate community composition and abundance changes by orders of magnitude from upstream to below Calgary. Um, the benthic invertebrate communities in the aqua streams and the Bow River um, are, are different um, and, uh, and need to be compared carefully. Preliminary RNA sequences shows the long those days, show responses to the background river contamination. The, hit, the flow water that comes into Aqua is downstream of two of the sewage treatment plants. And we can measure um, the responses from those upstream plants in those Aqua streams and then just some preliminary results from our, our exposures. So in terms of uh, HQP training, the orange uh, students are, are at Calgary. Um, the ones that should be in green are at the University of Alberta and the um, red ones are at McMaster, but a, a, a range of, of students involved in the project, there's gonna be a great deal of, of data coming out of this over the next couple years as these uh, students start to wrap up their work. And as I mentioned, a large number of partners involved in the study and uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and see if there's some time for, for discussion. Thanks, Kelly. Really appreciate uh, the initial insights to, to your project and look forward to seeing what else comes out of it. Um, we'll jump right into questions. We only have a, a few minutes left. Um, we'll try as many as we can. Um, so we'll start back with you, Paolo. Um, in the, the Q&A section, you should see published questions now. The first one here is from Mark Donner. Um, do any in situ passive samplers exist for microplastics? 
similar to trace organics or other contaminants requiring larger volumes for processing. In situ samplers, so they, there are some examples of that reported in the literature. Uh, we decided to go with this, uh, with the system that uh, is really designed based using the STM method that I mentioned, um, because it's been designed specifically for, uh, for sampling freshwater as well as wastewater. And the scope of the work being uh, freshwater sampling along the North Saskatchewan, we, we felt that at the time uh, that the system was coincidentally exactly, sorry, the SDM standard was coincidentally exactly what we needed. As it turns out, there's lots of learnings that we made and, and put forward recommendations for improving the standard. Um, but I think we'll continue with that. If you think, if you, if, if you in, in a context of passive sampling, nets are effectively passive sampling samplers. They just don't seem to work very well. We've, we've had a short and uh, painful experience and decided to abandon them. Fair enough. Um, second quick question for you. Um, are you planning on extending your work to other um, river basins in Alberta or is just going to be limited to I city? would love to. That's one reason why we're here. So if anybody's interested in doing that, uh, please, yes, there's uh, there's lots of really interesting questions that uh, one can ask from the point of view of uh, the different geography and uh, and different type of urban and um, industry settlements that are along our rivers. Um, I can go on to talk about it all the afternoon and I won't do that. So yes, please, if you're interested, I'm certainly open to that. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll jump over to uh, Steve here. Um, there's a few similar questions, but I'll, I'll ask this one for Patrick Marriott that uh, kind of summarizes a lot of the questions. Um, can 6PPD be replaced in tire manufacturing? Are there any policies being planned that you're aware of to address this, this um, issue? And um, second is tires are recycled into tire crumbs popular at recreational facilities, playgrounds. Do you know if there's any concern there? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> there are things I know of that I can't say. <laughs> um, there, there is some movement on the six PPD front when it comes to tires and legislation. And on the legislation part, I can't really say uh, anything more. Um, it's not a Canadian thing, uh, but there, there is some movement there. Uh, there are some manufacturers looking at alternatives right now. Uh, particularly in Europe uh, that I know about. Um, and this has really created a bit of a stir among tire manufacturers. Uh, so there, there is an active, uh, they, are, they are active in looking for alternatives. And then there was one more part to the question, I believe. Oh, the, the rubber tire. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we've actually talked about that within, uh, with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I mean, you see that in playgrounds, you see it in indoor soccer fields, you see it uh, in driveways, we're using rubber now. Um, so there's no doubt that when it rains, there's chemical leaching off of that. Um, I, I don't know, uh, I've heard some people at Health, this has come on the radar of some people at Health Canada. I, I have no idea what they're doing, but I, don't, I do know people are talking about this in terms of you know, human health. Uh, for example, uh, you know, it got me thinking about, you know, Guy Fox night um, in Newfoundland, where I grew up, we'd often go to the beach and we'd burn rubber tires, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, but um, there's a lot, and it's not just 60 PD quinone in, in, or 60 PD in rubber tires. There's a lot of other stuff in there um, that, you know, can have some pretty adverse effects. Uh, thanks. And building off of that, um, you may not have the answer to this, but you, you mentioned already human toxicology, but um, how does this affect the human body? And that if you were to eat some of the fish from the stream and is 6-PPD quinone toxic to invertebrates? So just some questions about um, impacts to, to other species. Um, it, the, for the invertebrates that have been studied so far, there's been no indication of toxicity um, in, in the few species that have been studied. Um, not a lot known on sublethal effects. Uh, there's a little bit showing some potentially altered behavior, but these are really high concentrations that people are using for that. 
uh, we started to do some work using omics to look at potential subluxal effects. Uh, we haven't got the data all mined yet. Um, and then um, eating fish, there, there hasn't been much done on the, the bioaccumulation of this. We do know it goes into the bile. But tissue concentrations, I haven't seen anything. The only thing I've seen is a study in Japan showing that it does cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brains of some species of fish, but I have no idea how much uh, accumulate. Um, and so, uh, you know, without a risk assessment, I, I couldn't say and without knowing how much is in there. But <laughs> my general thinking about fish is that there's so many healthy benefits to eating fish that I wouldn't shy away from them necessarily. It's like tuna. It might be a bit of mercury, but tuna is also quite good for you. So everything in moderation. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. <laughs> um, I'll just do one more here for Paolo. Um, published it here. So Paolo, um, wonder what the analytical method you are using and what method did the California Water Board recommend for analytical method? Yeah, we, we're in alignment on that one as well, uh, Vicky. We're using infrared spectroscopy. There's uh, methods that are well developed for that. Um, we've been also working with Dow Chemical Canada and that, that's uh, using a quantum cascade system, which is an advanced uh, way of doing infrared spectroscopy that allows also for combined microscopy at the same time as doing the interrogation of the surfaces. And um, and these are all methods that allow you to look comfortably down to about 10 microns. Nominally, you should be able to go lower than that. I don't know if, I don't know if I trust the data much below the 10 micron range, but that's the skeptic in me. Um. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have a lot of other great questions. We really appreciate the interest in our talk. Um, again, thank you for your patience with the technical challenges. Uh, a big thank you to our speakers, and thank you for everyone for attending today. Um, I hope this session does spark some new ideas, some new questions, some new lines of research. Um, the session is being recorded and available for future viewing. You'll see an email sent out when it is uploaded and available. Um, watch your emails for future sessions planned for 2023, and we look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Thank you very much.